Okay, welcome to another member Zoom call where we're going to go over your questions that you submitted and any that you think of during the Zoom if anybody's online with us. So chat in those questions that you might have. Um, and let's uh, get to your questions. Uh, just a reminder, everybody, to look at our blog posts on the member site and on our website. Um, we have well over a thousand blog posts, and it would um, it is something you may be needing to find something out about on Thursday afternoon. We can't wait till next Wednesday Zoom call if you search it in that little. Think of the pop there, that little icon you might find what you're looking for. First question Is there anything you can re recommend to increase energy? Okay, good question. Anything you can recommend to increase energy? Fair question. But I would not be a good doctor if I didn't ask a question of a question, right? And the question to this question would be asking the question why. So why does a person, you've got to find out why a person has a low energy. So um, yeah, if you want to increase energy, what does the world tell you to do? Well, you take an energy drink or you drink some caffeine or something like that. Well, that's not treating the real cause of the decreased energy. So you got to look at, okay, what's causing my decreased energy? So what could be causing decreased energy for anybody, you know, whether you're a cancer patient or not? Well, the first thing that you think of is uh, an anemia. So an anemia is when you have low red blood cell count or low hemoglobin or both. If that's the case, that's definitely going to decrease your oxygen carrying capacity of your red blood cells. And that's going to decrease the energy that you're getting to the brain. Um, that's where you're really going to feel the decreased energy. So when a person says, I don't have any energy, they're not getting good oxygen um, carrying capacity to the brain. Um, so treating the anemia, so treating the cause of the decrease uh, energy, in this case, anemia, is the most important thing. So if the person has anemia with cancer, do look at our blog post about treating anemia with cancer, but definitely you're going to look at about adding some iron. And if you're going to add some iron, think about adding some artemisinin as well. If you add iron, you should always add artemisinin and take them together. Um, because the problem with anemia with cancer is that cancer can gobble up iron. And if you're gonna if it's gonna gobble up iron, well, let's let's let uh, artemisinin ride with it. So artemisinin binds to iron. So and I have information on the blog post about that. Artemisinin binds to iron, and artemisinin can be a cancer killer. So we're giving the option, you know, if the cancer is going to gobble up the iron, it's going to gobble up the artemisinin too, and we can actually kill the cancer via the artemisinin. So treating the anemia, treating the cause. Let's say I have anemia due to something else. Let's say I have anemia due to an infection, or let's say I have a lack of energy due to an infection, or a chronic infection. That's not an uncommon thing a chronic infection. How would you know that? That would you know if your white blood cell count is above seven, maybe 7.5. Um, that's in the normal range. If you look at a white blood cell test, you look at a CBC test, typically most labs are going to say normal white blood cell count is 4, 4.5 to 10, 10.5, or maybe even 11. But really, if you have a white blood cell count over 7.5, you do have a hidden infection. That can be a cause of that of the decreased energy. You can have just inflammation. So chronic inflammation um, can be a cause of decreased energy. So that could be due to food sensitivities, food allergies. I've had people with hidden food allergies of gluten 
and you know it causes inflammation in the brain and it causes just a decrease uh, energy and they get really super sleepy and can't figure out why I need to be take, drinking coffee in the afternoon. I feel like I need to take a nap. What's wrong with me? It's because they're eating a food that they have sensitivities to. How would you find that out? Run a Cyrex panel. Typically a Cyrex array, uh, array 10 uh, gives you a test of 200 or 100 different foods cooked and raw. Um, that would give you a good broad panel of, do I have food sensitivities that I need to look at? Remember, you know, your cheek swab testing is not going to test for antibodies to food. So you, you know, you might have, um, you know, I might have taken you off of, let's say, dairy or pork or something like that. That doesn't mean you have a food sensitivity to those things. It means that's driving your cancer. You could have food sensitivities, that is, i.e., antibodies to different foods or peptides in different foods that can cause you all sorts of comorbidities. So you might have cancer and you might have a decreased energy totally caused from the cancer, but you could have cancer and you could have a comorbidity of decreased energy and it's caused from a totally different condition. You know, that isn't even tied to the cancer. Usually if you have anemia with cancer, that's tied to the cancer. But you could have a chronic infection that's not tied to the cancer. You could have inflammation due to food sensitivities or food antibodies that's not tied to the cancer. You could have another totally different disorder. And most commonly would be an autoimmune disorder. So looking at that might be a thing. So looking if you have an autoimmune um, condition uh, would be, and that would be you know, it should be a contact call with me because we need to talk about that. But how you would test for that is um, you would do a Cyrex array um, five if you thought it was an autoantibodies to uh, peripheral tissues or a seven X if you thought it was antibodies to neural tissue. Um, so that's Cyrex labs is the best labs to look for antibodies. So. So, no, there isn't, is, you know, let's say, let's say it's none of these. And it, let's say, you know, a common cause for a decrease, just a mild decrease energy can be an, an adrenal fatigue. Um, you know, you're getting um, just, you know, a, you know, just fatigue from all the weariness of, of treating your, what's going on? computer uh treating your cancer and treating your you know whatever you just have some adrenal fatigue and some um low energy from just a hormone suppression common with people that are dealing with chronic disease of all kinds and then you'd think of what would you do for that you'd think of adaptogens so adaptogens are are different nutrients that um, uh, can just help bring up the adrenals, uh, can calm down a hyperadrenal state, can can just kind of balance your hormones, and can really help you with anxiety and with stress issues. Chronic stress can certainly cause adrenal fatigue, um, and then you end up with a decreased energy. So that the obviously this is super common with anybody dealing with cancer or any other, you know, disease long-term. And this can be addressed with just adaptogens. The beauty of adaptogenic herbs is that you can't take too many of them. You know, you just can't. And um, it, it just helps bring balance. So if your adrenals are, are fatigued, um, it can help bring that up. But if your adrenals are in overdrive because you're just in a stress state, it can help bring that down. Hence, adapting, adapting you to the environment. That's where it got its name. So those are some things that you think of. What do you recommend to combat night sweats? Some evenings I have to change my shirt anywhere from one to three times. Thank you. So again, you're looking for the cause. What is the cause, right? So you don't, you, you know, we are, that's all we're looking for. What's the cause of the symptom? If you have a symptom, 
Okay, well, this person knows what the cause is. Uh, the person who asked this has a lymphoma, which causes night sweats. Not all cancers do that. Um, there isn't anything, if a person knows the cause, lymphoma, there really isn't anything to combat the night sweats. Um, adaptogens can work because part of the thought, because understand, night sweats with lymphoma, it isn't fully understood why that takes place. Because you don't get night sweats with a lot of other cancers. You don't get night sweats. So, but it's common with lymphoma. It's thought that it's causing an, uh, uh, an estrogen, progesterone, androgen fluctuation. That's one theory. If that is true, then adaptogens could be a help. Um, I've had people you do with lymphoma take adaptogens. It was, you know, nobody has said, oh my gosh, this has just made a hundred percent difference. Nobody said that, but nobody said nothing makes a hundred percent difference with night sweats. Um, I've had people say that they've had some change. They thought that it was better with that. So consider using some adaptogenic herbs. What are adaptogenic herbs to get more specific? Um, we have a product called, um, Corta Clear. That would be the best adaptogenic herb for night sweats because it helps decrease cortisol. Um, but we also have, we have about 10 adaptogenic products. So their adaptogenic herbs are, are cordyceps, uh, uh, holy basil, uh, eleuthero. Uh, there's just a whole bunch of different herbs that fit into that category. And um, uh, there's a bunch of different blends out there that because of that. So um, different blends work for different people. So, um, but I would think for night sweats, if I was gonna use an adaptogen, I would try Cordoclear and I would take a couple, an hour, half hour before bed. I had the genetic testing done. How can I find out if I was tested for the following genes? MTHFR, C H C Y. C-O-M-T, M-T-T-R-R, M-T-R. I don't know how to read the book I was given. So everybody, if you've had a genetic testing done through us, you were tested for these. M-T-H-F-R is in the folate pathway. H-C-Y, C-O-M-T are in the uh, biopterin pathway. M-T-R, R and M-T-R, that's how you make B12. These are in... Um, the methionine pathway. So these were tested for and they're in your chart. So understand though, um, there's common misconceptions out there. So if you're Googling these things or you're seeing Instagram posts about things, there's one nutritionist, quote unquote, I don't even know who he is, but he, I just saw an Instagram video that basically said, you know, these, if you have an MTHFR defect, I can't even remember because I scrolled past it quick because this, this is the stupidest thing in the world because he gave some threatening thing that if you have an MTHFR defect, you know, this is the most common thing in America that's missed and this is what's causing cancer or something like that. It's just a bunch of hooey balooey. So MTHFR defect is methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase gene and you have two genes in that family and um it, you know that was one of the more research genes and one that was originally one of the first ones that were tested in genetic testing and there's been a ton of misinformation about it and i have tons of videos on this that you should watch um so that you can learn about them and you'll learn about them in the Read Your Genes course, which all of you listening to this have access to. If you're a member, you have full access to the Read Your Genes course. Click on it, start watching some of those videos that are in there. That will tell you all about these genes. I have different videos on each one of these genes. So the reason why I bring this one up is because there's more misinformation about that flying around the internet than probably anything on the planet. And it, a lot of um, well-meaning, misunderstood practitioners will give somebody, you know, you have to get on methyl groups, methyl tetrahydrofolate, which is the correct form of folate that a person should be taking. 
but because you have a gene defect on the, one of these two genes in this family, everybody needs to be on that product. And that is just totally wrong. The bad effect can be very harmful, especially if you have defects on the, on the serotonin genes and the comp genes in, in the, in the um, biopterin pathway, you could actually push, um, you know, taking too many methyl groups, I have long said, can you know, turn off genes, which can turn off tumor suppressor genes, but also taking too many methyl groups will push the biopterin pathway, which will push an excess release of serotonin if you have defects on that gene that could cause all sorts of emotional imbalances. The COMP gene has been tied to, this has to do with biopterin, which has to do with neurotransmitter um, function and neurotransmitter production, but it also has been tied to breast cancer. Um, so if, if you have defects in these genes, we have made recommendations on what to take based upon those defects. So rest assured, we've already addressed these. The MTRR and the MTR gene are how you cycle and create uh, adenosylcobalamin and hydroxylcobalamin, which is B12. So this is B12 production right here. Uh, if you have defects in that, we typically tell you that it might be good to be taking a B12 supplement. And what do we recommend? Methyl B12? No, we typically recommend adenosylcobalamin or hydroxylcobalamin because excess methyl groups are not necessarily good for a cancer patient. What is your opinion of, and the person left this out. So I added this to the question because the person asked the question, what is your opinion of for a person who has had estrogen driven breast cancer, the purpose taking it would be to help make muscle. And so I added this. So if, if, I don't think the person who asked the question is on the call. Um, but if you if this is not what you meant, then please ask this question again for next week um, because you didn't have the product in here. I assumed that you meant uh, uh, because creatine is so commonly for the purpose of helping make muscle. So I just added it. So, um, if this was your question, can a person with estrogen-driven breast cancer take creatine? The answer is no. So a creatine supplement, creatine supplementation is, is very, very popular in the exercise world. Um, uh, bodybuilders will be taking it because creatine can help build uh, muscle and it is proven to help build muscle. So people that want to build more muscle and are lifting weights typically will be taking creatine. I wrote a blog post about this. Should cancer patients take creatine? So you can learn about it right there. And the answer is no. There was a study, a couple of studies back in the 90s that said creatine can help people with cancer, but there's, <laughs> been several dozen studies since then, and some more recent ones that actually say that creatine can um, can increase metastasis and increase the growth of a metastatic cancer. So um, I say no, and it's not just for breast cancer; it's for all sorts of cancers. But one of the studies specifically listed breast cancer with creatine. So the the simple answer to this, should cancer patients take creatine? The answer is no. Is there an easy way to queue up several RIFE programs to run them back to back, say two or three half hour programs? Um, yeah, there is. It's called stacking programs. So there's a video in the member site on the RIFE resources. The video is, I just took a screenshot of the video. It's right here, stacking programs, creating your own private folder and duplicating programs. Um, now in the version 6.4, I haven't played with this, but it's supposed to be an easier way to stack programs. So this is some of the benefits of some of the newer versions. Uh, and Jake uh, Turaifa said the version 7.0 is going to even have more 
um, benefits um, than uh, and, and things like this, just to make your life of rife use easier. But it's really for people that don't have a personal program like I created for you. So it's people that are just who bought a rife and are just running it for, you know, different things, you know, where they want to run three foot fungus programs together. Oh, well, they can stack those three together. So they don't have to restart the machine every two hours or whatever, how long your foot fungus program is. So it's not going to be as pertinent to my, you know, our members, but um, you know, the, the improvement, that's why I'm saying, tell everybody, even though it can be a hassle, it, it, I think the things that, that True Rife is trying to do is our improvements. I have struggled with heartburn for years. I used Prilosec for years. You realize Prilosec was created, it was only approved for maximum of 30 day use. I used Prilosec for years until I learned better and ask the doctor for another solution. I have been using Pepsin for several years. Okay, so what did I say a good doctor should do? Okay, this is, I'm just being facetious maybe, but I think a good doctor needs to ask a simple question. Why does the patient have heartburn? Does the patient have heartburn because they have a deficiency in Prilosec? Oh, well, Prilosec's not good for us. Well, let's give him Pepsin. I don't think you have heartburn because you have a deficiency in Pepsin. And I don't mean to be mean, but this is the wrong thing to do. This is the wrong way to treat disease because <clears throat> it's not treating disease. It's covering up symptoms. I've said it for you know decades. It's like, okay, my car, <coughs> probably Jeepers, the check engine light is coming on. So what I got to do is take a piece of black electrical tape and I got to put it right over that blasted light because it bothers me. You know, now I don't see the light anymore. Got that fixed. I got to keep driving my car. Okay, that's silly, stupid, right? And I don't mean to be mean, but this is the way we have been taught by our medical profession to treat disease. Hasn't it? Okay, so heartburn, okay, is a sign of what? Heartburn is a sign of decreased hydrochloric acid production, period. That is, I mean, if you have heartburn, you definitely have a decreased hydrochloric acid production by the parietal cells of your stomach. Okay, what does that lead to? If by the time you already have heartburn, um, you probably already have um, had a decreased hydrochloric acid production for probably months, and you probably already have what can be a major, major cause of cancer uh, is a major, major cause of cardiovascular disease. And it is what? H. pylori um, overgrowth. So Helicobacter pylori is the most prominent, most common bacterial infection worldwide. It is the number one cause of stomach cancer. It causes multiple other cancers and it's top five cause of cardiovascular disease. Um, so it is a bad guy. So if you have had heartburn for years, you, you don't need to do an H. pylori test. You know that it's present. So you need to, I have a whole blog on this. Okay. So look at this blog. Um, and, um, that will help you the most. I actually have multiple blogs on H. pylori with some different videos on it. So that, that will help you. So that's the particular podcast that you could look at. Um, HCL with your meals is the best thing to do. But some people that have had this for years, they try taking H HCL and it really hurts their stomach. Well, that's a sign that they have a really damaged stomach cells, possibly already ulceration. Um, you need to switch back to uh, taking apple cider vinegar for a period of time with your meals. Oh my gosh, that hurts too. I can't even take apple cider vinegar. Then you need to heal the stomach with deglycerized licorice. I have a whole protocol in that blog post that will help. Certainly, if you need to chat with me, I'll gladly talk to you through that as well. But dealing with H. pylori is so, so important. The main treatment nutritional product for H. pylori is the, is um, um, 
the berberine is your is your main nutritional killer of H pylori. Garlic works really well too. Um, that's why I that's why that's one of the reasons why berberine is one of my absolute favorite supplements, hands down. Um, and is because you know you know cancer is super common, right? But heart disease is even commoner. That's not a word. It's even more common. And um, number one killer in America is heart disease, cardiovascular disease, and it is, you know, H. pylori is a major player in that, um, and H. pylori is a major player in cancer. So we can keep that knocked down. The better we can do. I'm wondering if there's a supplement that I'm taking that could be uh, elevating my uh, blood sugar levels. I've always been close to 100 in the mornings, and now up to 128. I looked at your protocol and I don't, the person who asked this question, and I don't see anything in your protocol that would um, be causing in, uh, an elevated um, glucose level. The only thing I saw is something that you were taking that isn't from us, and that was a beetroot powder. So depending on the source of that beetroot powder, that could be it, but I don't even know that you're continuing to take this. So no, we should probably schedule a time to talk over that, see what else is going on. I went to a hand surgeon to check out my finger, wrist, pain. X-rays showed nothing wrong with my bones. He suggested a steroid injection in my wrist for decorvain's symptoms. So Dequer veins um, uh, syndrome, it's called a syndrome, is when you have pain in your wrist or hands. Um, and uh, that was named by a, maybe an orthopedic surgeon back in the 1800s or something like that. Uh, and now the medical field will treat it with just a steroid injection. Um, and you said, I wanted to talk with you first. So um, I know. So this decorvades syndrome is just that. So whenever you, <clears throat> it's not a disease, it's a syndrome. What's a syndrome? It's a collection of symptoms that we have no idea why it's there. Okay. So again, you know, you're trying to ask why, right? Now, it was the right thing to do for them to take an x-ray because at least they're trying, they're asking why is there, is there inflammation, you know, showing at the, at, at the, in the tendons, is there um, arth arthritic spurring or decreased joint space, early de degenerative changes that could be causing this. Um, and the answer was, no, there wasn't any orthopedic things. Well, then we'll just call it the syndrome of hand and wrist pain. And then we look up in Merck manual, computer Merck manual now, and it says to give a um, steroid injection. Well, again, that's, you know, you stopped asking why. So um, you sometimes when something comes up, you look at the person's history and you say, could anything that has changed since these symptoms started to appear be responsible for it? And we talked about this already. We talked to Dr. Jen about this. And she said the aromatase inhibitors can cause this. And that is true. Um, and then I told you that it's most likely because of the oral chemo drugs. And I would still suggest because you've been off the aromatase inhibitors and the pain hasn't gone away, that it's more likely to do be due to the oral chemo drugs. Because chemo drugs can cause um, hand, what is called hand and foot syndrome, which is exactly what you have. So, and again, that's a syndrome. We need the person just has pain. And it's the chemo drugs that have, have irritated the joint capsules um, and it can cause um, a secondary inflammatory arthritis that um, is not necessarily present visibly on uh, an X-ray or CT scan or MRI yet. So understand, let's take a step back a little bit. When you have inflammation in a joint, pain in a joint, 
you, you ask that question, why do I have arthritis? Now, arthritis is, is arthritis, arth joint, itis, inflammation. So you have inflammation of the joint, but it is a disease. So there's two different types of arthritic disease. So there's two different types of arthritis. One is a degenerative arthritis, meaning that I hurt my knee in college playing football and it's, you know, progressively, yeah, I've been able to live with it, but it's progressively getting worse. And now I take an x-ray and my doctor said, boy, you have a really a decreased joint capsule, joint space um, in the right knee compared to the left knee. You have some degenerative arthritis taking place. The second type of arthritis is an inflammatory arthritis. That's your psoriatic arthritis, your rheumatoid arthritis, your um, your uh, um, uh, ankylosing spondylitis type diseases. Those are inflammatory diseases, which are often autoimmune. Um, so you have antibodies that have been developed against the joint capsule. Um, and that's causing inflammation and that's what's causing the pain. Now, inflammatory arthritis that are autoimmune like this will can eventually lead to uh, findings on x-ray. That's at a, a as the disease progresses. Um, now, what can cause these? Well, heavy metals um, uh, that irritate the joint capsule that cause your immune system to cause, uh, make antibodies to the joint capsule can cause that. Chemicals, poisons, like chemotherapy drugs that settle in the joint capsules. Remember, because in the, the periphery, the hands and the feet, you have less you know, blood circulation and therefore less apt to detoxify poisons that are circulating through your body. And they're going to be more apt to settle in peripheral nerves, causing nerve damage and um, nerve issues or in the joint capsules causing an inflammatory response and symptoms that are have been termed hand and foot disease due to chemotherapy. Um, so post-chemotherapy patients can get that. And it has to do with the, with the chemical settling in the joint capsule causing an inflammatory state long-term can cause an inflammatory arthritis and therefore seen on x-ray maybe one to two years later as the disease progresses. So how do you treat that? You treat it by detoxifying the chemo drugs as best you possibly can. Well, you're this person who asked the question is already on a whole bunch of chelators and binders and all this kind of stuff. So you can't, you know, take more of that. You need to just try to, you know, get that out of the tissue. You know, try to use the sauna, you know, use hot water baths in your hands. Try to get circulation. It's all in your hands. It's in your feet. You do it in both spots. Try to get more circulation. Try to get that pumping through there as best you can. Can there be, can, okay, my pain is so bad. Can I use a drug? Can I use a steroid? Well, yeah, you can. A steroid will decrease the inflammation. It can break that inflammatory cycle a little bit. There can be benefits. I'm not against using drugs if you're understanding what the cause of this is and you're treat, trying to treat the cause at the same time. Um, so using a medication to try to break that cycle, no sense just suffering. You know, God has given us medication to help us prevent. It would be silly to, to you know, you're not a statist or something. Of course, you can use medication to do that. Is it bad though? That's the question. Is it dangerous as a cancer patient to use a steroid? Let's stop right there. Is it bad for a cancer patient to use a steroid? Um, it depends. So if so, it's very common a person with brain cancer to be put on a steroid because the inflammation in the brain can be very dangerous because you only have so much space for that cancer to or inflammation to expand. Um, and then you could damage neural tissue. So it's important to be on a steroid if you have a brain tumor. But if you have pain 
uh, let's say you have pain in your spine because of spinal metastasis and you're going on an oral steroid that can decrease the pain if that's the only thing you can do. But the negatives of an oral steroid is that you are going to have some immune suppression. That's the negatives of an oral steroid. Do steroid injections cause the same thing? So I think this person is asking the question because she's smart enough to know that oral steroids do decrease the immune response and not a good thing to be on long-term, especially high dose, low dose, not quite so much. But an oral, a, this is not an oral steroid, a steroid injection. So a steroid injection is going to be a higher dose right to that area. And of course, you're going to absorb it through the rest of the tissue and it's going to circulate through the bloodstream. So you're going to have some systemic effects of it but it should dissipate pretty quickly since you're only getting one injection and you're not you know, taking it on a daily basis. So I wouldn't be opposed to it if, um, if, you know, if your pain is at a point where, gosh, I gotta do something about this, it's driving me crazy. I'm not opposed to doing that. Um, but, if, but also I would exhaust other things too. There's different creams that a person could try, comfrey cream, um, some calendula cream might be helpful. Some arnica creams, taking arnica might be helpful. I would try to exhaust those before I did that. But if my pain was like driving me crazy, um, I'd say, I don't think this is going to be a hindrance to the cancer by doing a steroid injection. Um, typically, they're only going to do one maximum two any time. Get this, the surgeon said, it's not, it's not, certain the drugs had anything to do with it um but it's too much of a coincidence for me yeah you kind of gotta you know you're thinking for yourself and it's like this all started when you know there it's a tie and it's known it's a, you know the drugs that they gave you are known to cause this so for them to say that a little silly um uh, but it's too much. And he said that people with diabetes and hypothyroid are prone, more prone to this. Um, I would say I'd give a person, if a person does have, you know, uncontrolled diabetes, yeah, they can be prone to inflammatory issues in their body. Um, hypothyroid, are you prone to um, uh, symptoms like this? Abs no, that is, that's, that's that's not true. Um, and just because your TSH has been higher than usual this year doesn't mean that you're in a hypothyroid state. You need to look at all those levels. Um, remember that we have a new video site. We're still organizing it. So please be um, uh, understanding of that. But I think we have most of our videos up on that site now. And the reason why we had to create that site, we've been working diligently to get that done is because YouTube is um, starting to just take down our videos. And um, it's just the writing on the wall is that they will take down our, our YouTube site because they don't like any alternative practitioners that are talking about cancer. Okay. Question from the chat. My rife bulb hasn't been lighting up the last three nights, the nightly program runs as normal, but no light, no sound from the bulb. Do you know what's happening? Uh, that's not good. So if your light, if your right light isn't lighting up at night, then it's you're not getting the frequencies. Um, so did the cord get pinched somehow? Did it get pulled out somehow? Is it not plugged in all the way? Do you have it switched to bulb? Make sure it's not accidentally switched to bat. Those are the things you want to look at. Um, you know, the, the, the bulbs typically don't burn out, but they can become damaged. Um, and, you know, and, you know, most common damages we've seen, it just happens to get yanked. The, you know, the solder got broken on it. Um, that will have to go back to True Rife to be replaced. I can't fix a bulb problem. Um, and um, you, you might just need to order a new one from True Rife. Um, it's not self-fixable. 
that way. So you can't resolder. If you broke the solder out, you can't resolder. It has to be a special type of solder and such. So you can't go around. You're not getting the frequencies if your bulb is not lighting up at all. I'm going to tell my oncologist tomorrow that he decided against chemo and hormone therapy. He told me last time he'd still help me whatever I decided. Well, that's nice. What kind of thing should I ask that he might help me with going forward? Blood labs, what kind of scans should I ask for and how often? Well, if you're not going to do the treatment from the oncologist, uh, and they're still willing to monitor you. That's the that's the number one reason why you'd stay with the with the practitioners if they're still willing to run labs and to cover it under your insurance and things. So um, if they're going to charge you for labs, then you want to do you do want to compare with the, on our lab store prices because you'll probably find that ours are a lot less expensive. But if they're going to run those through your um, insurance, then by all means, get them done through him. What labs should you run? Well, if you've had um, tumor markers done and they've been elevated, then I would continue to get those on a regular basis. Definitely get a CBC and complete metabolic panel done on a regular basis. How much is a regular basis? Well, if your labs are relatively normal, and you're relatively stable, then I would say monthly to begin with, and then you tatter down from tighter down from there to maybe every two months to every three months if you're doing real well. Certainly you you if something happens, you have an increase in symptoms or something, you know, you try to get another set of labs to see if you can get a diagnosis from that. Um and uh uh and those are probably the only labs that are going to run is uh, CBC, uh, complete metabolic panel, and uh, maybe two more markers. That's that's they probably won't run anything else even if you ask them. What kind of scans should I ask for, and how often? Well, that's everybody's different with that. Um, you know, most of our members don't want to run CT scans and PET scans and MRIs because they bring inherent you know, issues with it, you know, CT scans and PET scans, oh, blasted a lot of radiation. And unless, you know, it's going to make it change your decision and how you're going to treat it, you know, it, you know then, then I wouldn't necessarily run those. Even MRIs, you have, you know, a high magnetic field that, you know, some would argue is not the best for you. And then most likely you have to use a gadolinium dye. So, um, it really depends on you, but you know, so some people are like, no, I really need to find out. I really need to know. I want to get my, you know, CT scan on a, you know, he recommends a PET scan every, you know, X amount of months. Well, that's your choice. Um, and if that can settle your heart and settle your anxiety, then then you have to make that choice whether that's right for you or not. But just do know that it does some um, um, carrying the parent risks. It was suggested that I need MRIs after my implants. So if they need it to do, if they're doing the procedure and they want to make sure it was done correctly and there's not any issues and they need it, then by all means, I would agree to that. Um, but to just uh, to settle curiosity of whether I'm getting better or not, if you've already thought, again, I said it, you know, a hundred times that you only do a, a, an invasive test if it's going to change the way you treat the patient. Um, I used to teach doctors that, but teaching patients, you only agree to an invasive test if you may agree to a change in your in your treatment schedule. Meaning, if I've decided I'm not I'm done with doing chemo, no matter if my cancer comes back with a vengeance, I'm not going to do it anymore. Well, then why do any tests like that? So. Um, Test for ruptures in the implants, absolutely, yeah. So, yeah. So there's reasons to do things, right? So um, you just got to weigh that all out and, and use um, wisdom, which is a collection of knowledge from as many different people as possible. And then you pray about it and make a decision. So um, that's what we're all called to do, you know. So good, good questions.
Any other questions? All right, with that, we'll call it a night. Um, thank you for listening. We're um, look. Remember to look for changes on with the members only site. We actually are going to have some changes in our fee schedule for follow up exams. So we're actually lowering that, um, and we're changing how to schedule that. So, um, just uh. Keep an eye on that. That will change till next week. But. All right. Know that I love you all. I'm praying for you all uh, on a daily basis. And I uh, ask that you just continue to pray for us too. You guys have a great night. Bye-bye.